God bless you. PA here, Pastor Adam Burt, and I'm so excited that you would spend your Sunday morning here with us at Every Nation, New Jersey. And uh, listen, before we get into our series, we've just called The Beautiful Mess, and it's a series uh, unpacking the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, I need to talk to you about uh, baby names, all right? So, uh, my wife Susan and I, we, we, we had a family like real early. Our kids were, were in, in our real early 20s. And so uh, um, like for whatever reason, girl names were really easy for us to come up with. And so, uh, you know, we, we came up uh, like Cassandra uh, was our, our firstborn daughter. All right. And we Cassandra, uh, just to shoot you straight. Uh, the reason why we got that name is because there was a beautiful woman on the young and the restless. All right. So we named her Cassandra and uh, come to find out later on that her name actually actually means prophetess of doom, all right? Sorry about that, Cassie, all right? <laughs> your, your parents were young and dumb. Uh, then my, uh, the other uh, girl name was, was Elizabeth, was another one, and so for my, my uh, uh, youngest daughter, and then but we couldn't come up with any boy names, which in the end, it didn't matter because uh, we didn't have any boys, but we seemed to struggle with it. But I remember, man, I picked Joshua. Man, Joshua was going to be my boy's name because Joshua, man, he led him into the promised land. And then my uncle went and had a baby boy and he used the name Joshua. So he got it first, stealing the name from me. Okay. And, and so, uh, but then I thought, okay, but Joshua had a running mate and his name was Caleb and Caleb was strong and he, he wanted to, to get the highlands where the giants were. Caleb's my, my go-to name, right? Until uh, I, I worked a hockey school and in this hockey school, a bunch of little kids and I, I'm guessing this, this kid was about nine years old. There was a little kid and his name was Caleb. And this kid was the most whiny little mama's boy, make me want to throw up in my mouth type thing. And, and listen, I know he's only nine. Don't judge me. All right. Maybe this is a, a little bit too much honesty, but I'm like, Oh, I can't stand this kid. Right. The kid wrecked the name for me. <laughs> so if we ever had a boy, I was like, I can't do Caleb. Right. And, uh, unless somebody was to come in and, and redeem that name for me. And so, uh, I, I say all that to say this, I, I need to redeem a word this morning. And that word is this, the word fear fear. All right. And, and I want to do my best to redeem a little bit of that. And so there's no doubt that that fear can be something very negative, debilitating. Um, it, 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 for some people, it can be absolutely horrible. All right. But uh, not all fear is bad. Um, like I, there, there are some ridiculous fears, are there not? And so historically, I've always, uh, these made me giggle. Do you know that uh, the great Walt Disney, uh, the, the, the creator of Mickey Mouse, his great ter terror and fear is of mice, right? That uh, Gustav Eiffel, the architect uh, of the Eiffel Tower, guess what he's afraid of? You guessed it, he's afraid of heights, right? Uh, I, I personally uh, appreciate these ones, uh, these three, Alexander the Great, uh, Caesar, and Napoleon, they were all terrified of, wait for it, cats. Of course you are, man. Cats are unpredictable and weird, okay? Uh, and then for my cat people out there um, as well, did you know that Genghis Khan, he was only afraid of two things, uh, dogs and his mom, right? <laughs> How many had that mom out there, all right? So they, they uh, resonate with Genghis Khan, but um, there's, there's also fun f uh, fear, isn't there not? Like it's, it's why we engage in roller coasters. Or you'll go to a haunted house or watch those ridiculous horror movies, right? And, and there's, a, there's a fun fear. In fact, um, when my life, uh, wife and I, we drive on long trips and she inevitably is going to fall asleep. And, and then when she does, uh, I, I like to uh, just uh, swerve the car and scream, ah, like that. And so uh, for me, that's fun. <laughs> uh, for her, not so much, all right? And, uh, but, I, but seriously, there, there is a type of fear that'll keep you safe. Um, you know, there's two innate intrinsic fears inside of all of humanity. Like God hardwired it into us. And that's this, uh, the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. I feel like that's a good, gracious gift from God to help, uh, help keep humanity alive, right? Um, 
I was, I was reading the story of a, a woman who, uh, she had Urbach's Weiss disease. Urbach Weiss disease, and uh, it's a strange name, but the, the long and short of it is this, is that, that her uh, amygdala, it, that is the, the, the fear sensor in your brain. It's the, whoa, 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 it's the barking dog uh, that lets you alarm that, hey, this is not safe, okay? And her amygdala was calcifying and hardening, and so it wasn't functioning, and so she didn't feel fear. Now, when I heard this, I'm like, that would be amazing, right? And for the record, it's horrible. Because she, she doesn't sense fear, um, she's constantly putting herself uh, in dangerous, terrifying uh, positions. Uh, she's, been, she's been robbed on numerous occasions, held at knife point. Um, she's put herself in uh, uh, dangerous situations where she's fallen, hurt herself. And in fact, uh, when they were doing the study on her, she actually, uh, when they weren't paying attention, she, she inadvertently picked up a poisonous snake and she was just playing with it like this, right? And so, so we can see that there's a type of fear that, that'll keep you safe. And I know uh, as well, how many have ever experienced this, that, that fear can be a motivator, right? Uh, I, I just need to go on record. I, I think love is a greater motivator, but you know, love isn't always present. And so sometimes when there's no love or passion, that fear can be that motivator uh, that kicks in to see through, right? And, and so um, I, I'll, I'll admit to this, you know, like, like as a young kid, uh, I got good grades. I worked hard at school and at sports. Uh, I, I obeyed authority and kept the rules, right? And you know what? I, I didn't do any of that because I cared about rules. I cared about working hard. I did it all because I was afraid of my dad, right? I knew I didn't want to want to bring bad grades home or else, right? But but here's what's so great is um, here's what I didn't realize that my father was actually giving me a gift, but at the time I didn't really know it was. And so that's this this reverence or fear for my dad. Uh, it it kept me going until love could kick in. Does that make sense? Because listen, now I work hard. You know what? I obey the rules. Um, I, uh, I, I, I try to get good grades, if you will, okay? Uh, I do all that not because I'm afraid of my dad. For the record, uh, I can take them now, okay? <laughs> but, but I obey them all. Why? Because I love them. And so, see, I'm so thankful to, to have uh, like the fear of my father that could, could kind of keep me where I needed to be until I grew my own uh, love for these things. Does that make sense? And so, um, and so listen, uh, I want to redeem the, the fear, the fear of the Lord. And, and so uh, get this. I know many of you now, like my theologians are like, wait, 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 but pastor, wait, 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 wait. Uh, the Bible says in, in 1 John 4, 18, it says this, that perfect love casts out all fear. And, and I would agree with you, uh, but you need to read the rest of the verse uh, because then he, he goes on and says, for fear has to do with punishment. See, the big idea that, that John's driving home is, is this, that perfect love, when love is perfected in your heart, you're going to love what God loves and hate what he hates. And so intrinsically, uh, perfect love is going to obey God. Uh, but here's the problem. Uh, you and I aren't walking in perfect love yet. And so there is uh, a, a fear of punishment until that perfect love is, is uh, uh, grown in our heart, right? And so um, uh, some of you are thinking too in your head right now, hey, pastor, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I would say yes and amen to that. And that, that word uh, for fear, it's actually the word uh, to be timid, to be a coward. And God has not given us a cowardice spirit. Uh, in fact, it's, it's a bold and courageous spirit that God has given his saints throughout the ages. It's, it's why we could, we could stand up for Christ and uh, be thrown to lions and hung on the cross and be beheaded uh, for our faith. It's why we could stand up for injustices in the earth because God has given us a spirit of power and of love uh, and of a sound mind. But uh, I would tell you this, uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with your Bible, you know this, Jesus had a spirit of fear. <laughs> oh, if you don't believe me, let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. It says this, 
um, uh, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. So this is Isaiah prophesying of the coming Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and, wait for it, the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. See, Jesus had a spirit of fear. It was a spirit of the fear of the Lord, and he rejoiced in it. And, and I would say this, um, either through bad teaching or, or bad experiences, we've kind of like done away with the fear of the Lord, and we don't like to talk about it too much. And in doing so, we've robbed ourselves of, of something beautiful uh, and rich. And so, so the title of my message is this, that, that man, it's, it's a gift that doesn't feel like one, right? A gift that doesn't feel like one. And, and so um, uh, I'm going to speak to the men out there uh, this morning. So fellas, uh, listen in here. Uh, I want to tell you this, that, that David in the scriptures, David's cooler than you, all right? <laughs> no, don't worry, he's cooler than me as well, all right? But I mean, if you pay attention to his life, did you know that, that David never lost a fight he got in? Uh, for the record, uh, I had 95 fights uh, in the NHL. Uh, and by the way, the internet said that I won five of them. <laughs> all right, so David's cooler than me, okay? And tougher than me, apparently. Um, how about this, that, that David, um, he knocked down the giant giant with one shot. Um, I'll say this about myself. Uh, uh, when I was with uh, the Carolina Hurricanes, we were playing the New Jersey Devils, and, and I knocked out this guy, Grant Marshall, with one punch. Oh, wait a minute. No, no. It, it was actually the other way around. He knocked me out with one punch, all right? <laughs> and so again, David wins. David's just cooler than you or me. It says that, that women sang about him, that men wanted to be him. And so, so fellas, lean in, because David is going to give us the secret to his success. He says this um, in Psalm 34, verse 9. He says this, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. Those who fear him have no lack. That's the secret to David's success is a fear of the Lord. Um, I think you would agree if you look at the life of David, that David had this real unique relationship uh, with God. Like he just did, it says that he was a man after God's old heart. But I want to read uh, Psalm 25, verse 14, and, and listen to what it says. It says this, that the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. And so you want to have friendship with God. There's a, a prerequisite is to have this healthy fear and awe of who he is. And, and it, it can be hard to get a grasp on this, this idea of, of deep love, but, but reverential awe of who God is. And, and so I mean, maybe um, the way I could articulate it is this way is like, uh, like, like we're drawn to, to love and awe, aren't we? Like if you pay attention, uh, where do we go on vacations? Here's where we go. We go to mountains and oceans. Why? I would submit to you that they stir love and awe. Like if you've ever been up in the mountains, these high places with these breathtaking views and, and you love it, but then you look down and see how high you are, you're like, it gives you that, like your stomach flips a little bit. You're like, oh, you know, and, or, or, or if you've ever been in the ocean, I remember I was snorkeling and the waves were real tough and I was captivated by the beauty, but simultaneously I thought, oh my gosh, I could die out here, right? And it's so that, it's that kind of love and awe that we're talking about here, the fear of the Lord. C.S. Lewis, he tries to capture it, uh, this idea in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And uh, let me share from you a little excerpt from it. Um, this is Lucy inquiring about uh, Aslan. All right, Aslan is the Christ-like lion figure uh, in this book. And so Lucy says this, uh, is he a man, asked Lucy. Aslan, a man, said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is a king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who this is? The king of the beasts. Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking and either, uh, uh, excuse me, if anyone can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. 
Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver is telling you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good, and he's the king, I tell you. See, he's not safe, but he's good, and he is the king of kings. And so, so maybe that's just a, a little bit too highbrow for you. And, and, and for maybe some, some people that are a little simpler, uh, maybe I can present to you the Lion King. Like you recall in, in The Lion King, when, when Benzi and Shanzi, um, they start talking about Mufasa and they're like, they say, Mufasa, now that's power. Oh, even the name just sends chills through my spine. He goes, Mufasa. She's like, woo. She says, say it again, Mufasa, right? And so, so they do that and they, they almost love it, the terror and the awe, but it stirs something inside of them, right? Mufasa, say it again. And, and so um, we, we can see this idea of love and awe. And if I can take you back to, to uh, David, you know, David had a son. His son's name was Solomon. And the scripture is clear that he's the wisest man who ever lived. But, but can I give you a little secret to his great wisdom? In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, Solomon says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Do you know that, that um, he, he was also the wealthiest man that ever lived? That, that economists today estimate that if Solomon were alive today, he would be worth, wait for it, $2.1 trillion. Just to give you a little context, like Bill Gates is worth $130.6 billion with a B, and Elon Musk is worth $174.1 billion with a B. And so they, they would appear as paupers compared to Solomon. But can I give you the secret to his wealth? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. The reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. See, yes, please. Yes, please. Man, the fear of the Lord that brings riches, honor, and life. I want that for my own life. And now do you see why the fear of the Lord, it really is a gift that doesn't feel like one. And so in, in today's text, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and, and Paul is going to highlight uh, a group of Old Testament people whose evil desires um, uh, actually um, uh, overcame their fear of the Lord and their love for God, and, and, what, and they were destroyed in the wilderness. And so uh, let me read for you uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 1 through 10. It says this, Paul says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. And so what, what Paul is referencing here, he's like, these people, they were God's people that were delivered out of slavery uh, through the Red Sea, and he, he's equating them to the Red Sea, like we're baptized spiritual food like we partake of communion he's saying these people they were Christians just like you are the church in Corinth and now he's going to go on and there's going to be an alarm he says this in verse 5 nevertheless with most of them God was not well not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did verse 7 do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. He says, we, we, we must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. And so, Paul's saying that there's, there's these evil desires that we better be aware of because these people suffered loss. Why? Um, as, as examples for you and I that we don't make that same mistake. And so um, let, let's look, look at a few of these. Uh, I want to look at verse 7 that Paul says, he says, don't be idolaters. Verse 7, uh, he says, do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And so Paul's referencing uh, when, um, in, in the book of Exodus, chapter 32, where God's people worshipped a golden calf. And so um, uh, can I give you like the background to this is, you know, in, in Exodus chapter 6, God introduces himself uh, to Moses and to his people. And, and here's the promise from God. He says, 
I will be your God and you will be my people. I don't know if you hear that. that that's betrothal. That's covenant language. That's like me saying to, to Susan, Susan, will you be my wife? Right? And, and so it's this covenant language. And so what does God do? God delivers Israel out of Egyptian bondage and slavery, right? Ten plagues. He splits the Red Sea. Oh, and in fact, before they leave Egypt, God, God gives them all the gold of the Egyptians. And so it's, it's, it's not but a moment where Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to receive the commands from God and what it takes a little bit too long. And what do God's people do? They build an altar and a golden idol, a golden calf that they begin to worship. And the scripture's clear in Exodus 32. God is furious. He tells Moses, he goes, let me go. Um, I'm going to kill all of them and I'll start a new people with you. And Moses, as a type of Jesus Christ, he intercedes on their behalf. But, but get this, uh, listen, I, I know for some of us today in our 2023 sensibilities to, to think that God could be furious and angry, it almost seems offensive. But, but I would submit to you, like, like listen, Remember, this is betrothal language. This is covenantal marriage language between God and his people. And, and if, if, um, if I was preaching on a Sunday service and my wife is in the front row flirting with another guy, guess what? I'm not going to be okay with that, nor should I be. In fact, if I'm not furious, jealous, and angry, that says something. There's something broken inside of me or I don't care for her anyways doesn't it? And so for God not to be furious, um, it, it w would be unthinkable. And so they're worshiping a golden calf. And, and once they do this, when, when Moses comes down from out of Mount Sinai, he says something very odd. He has the people grind down the golden calf, uh, and then they, they're to drink the dust of the golden calf. And here's why. Do you know um, that, um, so if, if a husband was jealous for his wife, thinking she might have had an affair, that, that, that God made a provision in, in uh, Numbers chapter 5, and what they would do is this, is the priest would take some of the dust from the tabernacle, and he'd put it in a, in a drink, and then the, the woman accused uh, of adultery would have to drink the water down um, with, the, with the dust in it. And, and if she was innocent, she would be fine. But if she had sinned against her husband and against God, that, that she would blow it up and she would suffer, possibly die or become infertile, right? And so it, it's, it's the provision made for a jealous husband and God is a jealous husband. He's jealous for your heart and for mine. See, God is rightly uh, enraged. Um, if I could bring it back to the marriage analogy again, do you know that um, there, there's parts of me, my, my body, my mind, my heart, that are for my wife and for my wife only. It's, it's what makes her my wife. And in the same way that there's parts of your heart, your mind, I mean, your body that, that are for God and for God alone. And to share them with, with anyone else is idolatry. And, and God is a jealous God, right? And so uh, in, in uh, 1 John, it's amazing. It's, it's only five chapters long. And you know that the Apostle John, he's, he's the love apostle, right? And get this, there are like 46 times in the book of 1 John, uh, he uses the word love, 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 love. He's just constantly, man, love God, love God, love God. It's kind of the answer for everything. But then at the end of 1 John, he ends the, the, um, the, the five chapter book with these words. Uh, he says, keep yourself from idols credits roll. <laughs> like, what a bizarre way to end this book on love. He says, keep yourself from idols. That, that would be like me saying, um, hey man, oh, like we have a conversation and coffee or do anything. And then I'd say, hey man, don't go to sleep tonight. <laughs> You'd be like, what in the world? I'd say, hey man, um, you better watch what you eat tonight. <laughs> you know, like, so but wouldn't that put us all on high alert? And that's the big idea. That, that John is like, you better be on high alert because idols are subtle uh, and seductive. And so the usual suspects for idolatry in our own heart today, maybe it's, the, it's, it's surely not a golden calf, but I, here's what it, it will be. Sex, money, people, 
power. I mean, these are all powerful, uh, seductive forces that, that, will, that your heart will be tended uh, towards giving them yourself over to idolatry, to worship, to make those things ultimate rather than Almighty God. And, and uh, listen, I, I'm susceptible to it. Like, I, I remember early, like in, in my NHL hockey career, when I was playing, man, hockey time and time again would, would sit in the place of God and become ultimate in my heart. No matter how hard I tried, I felt like, oh man, it kept being the most important thing in my life rather than God being the most important thing. And here's the crazy irony. As I, as I, as I put um, hockey uh, uh, as ultimate in my life, you know what? I played worse hockey and I was miserable doing it. Isn't that a, a amazing? Isn't that like ironic? See, because uh, idols like money, sex, people, power, um, th there's nothing intrinsically wrong with these, but they just make really crummy gods. They're cruel. Um, there's one uh, uh, author, uh, educator, and philosopher, his name is David Wallace Foster, and he writes on this, man, the cruelty, cruelty of worshiping the wrong things. And get this, he's not even a Christian. He says this, he says, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never, ever have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when, the time, when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before you, they finally plant you. Uh, on one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, bromides, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. The trick is keeping the truth up, up front in daily consciousness. Worship power, you will feel weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to keep that fear at bay. He says, worship your intellect. Being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. And so, so man, F David Wallace Foster, he rightly identifies these wrong gods to sit on the throne of our heart. Unfortunately, he never identifies the one that is worthy to sit on our heart. And that is Almighty God. And uh, David Wallace Foster, uh, he would take his own life. And, and in this same story, do you know that it says that, that 3,000 men died in Israel that day because of all their uh, unrepentant idolatry, and God was not pleased. Look at the second thing that we need to be aware of that, that Paul says it's for our example. Let's look at verse 8. It's sexual immorality. Verse 8, he says this, We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. And so this word for sexual immorality, it, it's the word porneo uh, in the Greek. Um, it's, it's a junk drawer word for any kind of sexual activity outside of the marriage covenant. Beware of sexual immorality, right? And so what Paul's referencing here is in the book of Numbers, um, verses, uh, chapters 22 to 25, um, there's actually uh, the, the Moabites uh, wanted to wipe out Israel, but they weren't militarily strong enough. And so uh, um, Balak, uh, the king of the Moabites, he decided to hire Balaam, he was a, a prophet, prophet slash warlock. Um, he, he would hire um, Balaam to curse uh, the people of Israel. And so as Balaam went to curse, speak a curse over Israel, he winds up blessing them again and again and again. Rather than cursing three times, he, he winds up blessing. And Balak is furious. And Balaam's response is this, I cannot curse what God has blessed. He says this, there's the shout of a king among them. See, it's a, it's a subtle uh, uh, tip of the cap uh, to Jesus who is to come. But God says, I I'm not going to curse them. I'm going to bless them. And how does God, how does, does Israel repay, repay God uh, by, by overcoming the, the Moabites and then blessing them? Here's what they do. The, the very next chapter, that the, the Israelite men, they wind up sleeping with the Moabite women uh, in, in adultery and fornication, and they worship the God of Baal, right? And the Bible's crystal clear. It says this, the anger of the Lord was 
kindled, right? And at that moment, a plague broke out and 23,000 people died uh, in one day because God was not pleased. And so we need to beware of sexual immorality. And so I, I don't know how many of you have like, been guilty of this, but, but listen, I, I remember I was, I was trying out for Team USA. And uh, I don't know if you've ever wanted something real bad, and so you were going to be on your best behavior, read your Bible, pray, and do all that. I was doing it all, man. Why? Because I, got, I wanted God to bless me and let me make the team. And sure enough, I made the team. And I went out and did what every good Christian man would do after God blessed him so richly. I went out and got smashed with my teammates. And as we're, we're cruising the streets of Colorado Springs at about 2 a.m., there was a street preacher out on the corner preaching, and he asked me, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? So you, you want to talk about a buzzkill in that moment? And man, I, I remember this was a life-changing moment for me because I felt God draw a line in the sand with me. And he's like, hey, do you want to just use me for stuff that I can give you, or do you want me? Right? And that was a game changer for me. And, and listen, I, I just feel like there's many of us out there that that's practically your relationship with God. Hey, God, bless me and give me heaven and then leave me alone. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep with who I want to sleep with. I'm going to watch what I want to watch. And, and you just, just shut up and give me heaven. Right? And so um, do you know what happens when you do that? See, God, by definition, is no longer God. You are. You are. Beware sexual immorality. And then the third one is this, was grumbling and complaining. We read about that in verses 9 and 10. It says this, it says, We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. And so, um, this, this idea of beware of grumbling and complaining against God. So uh, it was funny, uh, just coming off the Christmas holidays, and, and we, we do it up here at Every Nation New Jersey. We, um, our, our children's ministers, Jason and Marge Garcia, like they buy toys for each and every one of the children, and they're wrapped under the, the tree, and then the children get to open up their very own present. And, and I remember after the celebratory moment, everyone's fired through all their presents, and, and one little kid uh, afterwards, you could tell he was just like, I, I was just like, hey man, what a cool toy, man, you got Legos. And he, he looks up at me and he goes, I don't want Legos. Oh, I just thought, I can take it from you if you'd like, right? <laughs> and, and, I, and I mentioned that to say, you know what? That's us. Like, that's us. Like, God blesses and he gives. And what are we doing? I don't like Legos, right? And so Paul's referencing Numbers chapter 21, and um, it's towards the end of Israel's wandering throughout the desert, and they're growing uh, impatient until the Israelites snap on Moses and on God, and they start grumbling and complaining again and again. They, they say, why? They accuse God of, why, why did you take us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? And they said, you give us no food to eat and no drink, and we're tired uh, of this manna from heaven. <laughs> and so, um, like, did you hear? Let me see if I get all the pieces right. So God delivered you out of bondage and slavery. They were slaughtering your children and oppressing you. He, in a mighty way, delivers you out. He protects you. He fights for you. He gives you water from a rock and bread from heaven in a desert. <laughs> and so what exactly is the problem? And so, so get this, like so often, uh, God gets none of the thanks for all that's good and right in our life, and he gets all of the blame for the bad. And it says this, God was not pleased with them. And it says that, that he, he allowed fiery serpents to go through the camp. Several people died. And listen, uh, we're, we're all susceptible to grumbling and complaining. In fact, I, like, I can remember this, this moment. I'm not, not proud of it, but it, towards the end of my NHL career, I, I had several back surgeries. I got a staph infection, and it did nerve damage in my, in my leg and in my back, and so I, I was forced to retire. But, but then I remember seeing a picture uh, of another one of my old teammates. This guy was a serial adulterer. Uh, he abused his wife, and yet he still got to play in the NHL. And I just remember just being so furious at God. And you know what? I had become like the grumbling and complaining 
Israelites. Like, um, I, I love, I thought Ernie Johnson said it so perfectly. For those of you that don't know Ernie Johnson, he's the Emmy Award winning, winning play-by-play announcer for TNT and the, the NBA Today. And, and so, uh, but Ernie Johnson, he's a Jesus guy, but um, you know, he, he was diagnosed with cancer. And immediately the question that bubbled up in his heart, God, why me? Why me? And then God, in just such a sweet and gentle way, he says, you know, uh, I don't remember you asking me this when, when you were winning Emmys. God, why me? Or, or when I gave you the, the million dollar contract with TNT. God, why me? Uh, you, have a, you have a lovely wife and family. God, why me? Right? We become the little boy with the Legos. And so God, he wants to save us uh, from grumbling and complaining. And it's not pleasing to God. Notice this. Um, let's go on in our text, verses 11 and 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says this. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. So, so listen, don't fall into this trap. Oh, God was just a, a grouchy old guy in the Old Testament. And now through Jesus and the cross, like God's just whatever you want to do is fine. Grace, grace. Uh, Paul's like, no, no. He says, those things happened and we're reading about them now. Why? Man, for your example, don't do what they did. And so there's this, for me, I think it's so foolish. Uh, how many have heard the quote, man, experience is the best teacher. <laughs> I strongly disagree. I would much rather learn from the experience of others. Let them step in the landmines, let them bleed so I don't have to. Uh, in fact, uh, the great Michael Jordan, is, they, they put together the 1984 Olympic uh, basketball team and it was coached by Bobby Knight. And so if you don't know Bobby Knight, this man was insane. He would, he would scream at his players, throw chairs at his players, like he was out of his mind. And so, but uh, one reporter noticed that, man, Michael Jordan never got yelled at. And so this reporter, he interviewed him, and he's like, how do you always seem to avoid the wrath of Bobby Knight? And so I, I, I love what Michael Jordan said. He goes, I just see what they're getting in trouble for. And I don't do that. <laughs> and so uh, uh, such simple but profound wisdom that you and I, hey, let, let's learn from the mistakes of our Christian brothers and sisters of the past, right? And um, let's, let's avoid, let's be alert for evil desires, idolatry, sexual immorality, grumbling uh, and complaining, because these things aren't pleasing to God. And then verse 13, and we'll land the plane, such good news. Verse 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be, be able to endure it. I love this promise from God. God promises whenever these evil desires come up, when the temptation comes, he's going to make a way of escape. And so um, uh, back in uh, 2001, uh, September 11th, there was a young man, Wells Crowder. He was worked, working up in the South Tower of the World Trade Center. And uh, when, when finally the first uh, terrorist attack hit, hit, struck the South Tower, and, and with it, there was just panic, confusion. There were, there were jet fuel and, and blinding smoke. Um, shard glass was everywhere. But Wells Crowder, Wells Crowder, he, he, was, he was a hero. And he went about looking for survivors. And amongst the, the black and the smoke, he was able to shout out through everybody. He says, follow me. I found a way out. And so he grabbed people and he would, he would lead them down to the rescuers, go back up, do it again and again and again. And he would save some 18 people before eventually the tower collapsed on itself and Wells Crowder died, a hero. And you know, uh, that's the story of our Savior Jesus. And I pray this, whenever you feel the pull, the desire, evil desires rise up, God has a promise. He says, follow me, and I'll make a way of escape for you. Let's pray. Father, we just, uh, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you made a way by the power of your Holy Spirit. And listen, I, I want to pray for you out there today, that if there's any of you this, uh, this morning that you're, you're feeling kind of the weight 
of con condemnation. Can I, can I remind you of, of John uh, 3.17? We're all familiar with John 3.16, but do you know John 3.17? Like John 3.17, it says this, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. So if you feel any weight of condemnation this morning, man, that's not from the Lord. Here's what I promise you, is Jesus is drawing near to you today um, um, in your sin to help you fight against that thing. God will make a way of escape. And so, Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you that you're such a good and gracious God. I pray that we would be a people uh, that are, they have grateful hearts. Lord, that we'd be a people, uh, Lord, that long to like that, that faithful spouse, Lord, to commit our lives to you. Lord, thank you for our salvation. And I pray that you give us the grace, strength, and the courage to live out our salvation well. In Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said, Amen. Amen. Well, listen, God bless you, every nation, New Jersey. The sermon's over, but we're not quite finished. I need to remind you that you can be faithful in your tithing and your giving. For those of you that, that, that have been tithing and supporting us here at Every Nation New Jersey, can I just say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, there's three ways that, that you can continue to give. Uh, if you, you can go to our website, encnj.org, and just hit the giving icon. Uh, or you can give via text. This is the way my family and I give. It's super convenient and easy. If you just text the letters ENCNJ to the number 77977. Uh, or lastly, you can mail in your check or money order right here to our church offices at 101 Gibraltar Drive, right here in Morris Plains, New Jersey. And may God richly and abundantly bless you as you give. Man, listen, Jesus loves you, and I think you're pretty amazing too. Have a fantastic week.